Knee conditions. The knee conditions to be discussed within this lecture include fractures of the knee, tibia, and patella, dislocations of the tibiofemoral joint and patella, patella tendon rupture, apophysitis, including Oshkin Slaughter's and Sending Larson Johansson disease, sprains of the ACL, PCL, MCL, and LCL, meniscal tears, osteochondral defects and osteochondritis desiccans, and patellofemoral stress syndrome, which includes fat pad syndrome, chondromalacia patella, tendinopathy, bursitis, IT band friction syndrome, and plica, as well as peroneal nerve contusion. A tibial plateau fracture is a bone fracture or break in the continuity of the bone occurring in the proximal part of the tibia. The tibial plateau is a crucial weight-bearing area located in the upper extremity of the tibia and is composed of two slightly concave condyles, a medial condyle and a lateral condyle, that are separated by an intercondylar eminence and the sloping areas in front and behind. The tibial plateau fractures may be divided into low energy and high energy fractures. Low energy fractures are commonly seen in older females due to osteoporotic bone changes and are typically depressed fractures. High energy fractures are commonly the result of motor vehicle accidents, falls, or sports related injuries. These causes constitute the majority of tibial plateau fractures in young individuals. Tibial plateau fractures typically present with knee effusion, swelling of the knee soft tissue, and inability to bear weight. The knee may be deformed due to displacement and or fragmentation of the tibia, which leads to loss of normal structural appearance. Blood in the soft tissue and knee joint, or hemoarthrosis, may lead to bruising and a doughy feel of the knee. Due to the tibial plateau's proximity to important vascular and neurological structures, injuries may occur during fracture. A careful examination of the neurovascular symptoms is imperative. A serious complication of tibial plateau fractures is compartment syndrome, in which the swelling causes compression of the nerves and blood vessels inside the leg and may ultimately lead to necrosis or cell death of the leg tissue. The management of a tibial plateau fracture should include splinting the person in the position that they were found and checking for a distal pulse. A patella fracture is a fracture of the kneecap, which is one of the most common knee injuries. It is usually the result of a hard blow to the front of the knee or landing from a fall on the patella. The incidence of patella fractures in the National Football League or NFL is on the rise. Players are taking the knee pads out of their uniform, and the league has seen a fairly significant spike in patella fractures. Without the knee pad, there is nothing to protect the superficial bony structure from helmets, shoulder pads, and the hard impact of the ground. Common signs and symptoms include sharp and throbbing pain, increased pain with active knee extension, crepitus or crunching feeling, prepatella bursa rupture is also possible. Managing a patella fracture should include splinting the patient in the position found in referral. Treatment options for patella fracture include non-surgical and surgical options depending on the type of fracture. An undisplaced fracture of a patella takes around four to six weeks of immobilization in a cylinder cast while a displaced fracture requires surgical treatment followed by quadriceps strengthening exercises for complete rehabilitation. Bipartite patella is a congenital condition, which means it's present at birth, that occurs when the patella is made out of two bones instead of a single bone. Normally, the two bones would fuse together as the child grows, but in a bipartite patella, they remain as two separate bones. Individuals with a bipartite patella are often confused as having a fractured patella. X-rays can help distinguish between this condition and a fracture. Knee dislocations are commonly accompanied by arterial and nerve injuries. Most anterior dislocations result from a hyperextension. Most posterior dislocations result from a posteriorly directed force to the proximal tibia while the knee is slightly flexed. Most knee dislocations result from severe trauma, for example, a high-speed motor vehicle crash. But seemingly slight trauma, such as stepping in a hole and twisting the knee, can sometimes also dislocate the knee. A dislocation of the knee will frequently injure surrounding structures that help support the knee joint, which causes joint instability. Joint instability due to extensive ligamentous injury is a common long-term complication of knee dislocation. Other structures that are commonly injured include the popliteal artery, particularly in anterior dislocations, and the perineal and tibial nerves. 
Undiagnosed arterial injury has a high risk of ischemia complications, which may lead to amputation. Dislocation causes deformity that is clinically obvious. However, some dislocations spontaneously reduce before medical evaluation. In such cases, the knee remains very swollen and grossly unstable. Fullness in the popliteal fossa suggests hematoma or popliteal artery injury. Management of a tibiofemoral dislocation includes stabilizing the patient as movement is contraindicated or not advised. As other structures may be involved, the potential for complications is great. Please check the distal pulse and refer the patient immediately. Patella dislocation is when the patella slips out of its normal position in the patella femoral groove and generally causes intense pain with swelling of the knee. The patella frequently dislocates laterally and can be accompanied by acute pain and disability. Immediate reduction can be accomplished by extension of the knee and by providing a medial pressure to move the patella back into the patella femoral groove. Extension of the knee on its own could possibly move the patella back into place because this motion locks the knee. When the knee is locked, the ligaments are twisted and taut and allows the muscles involved to relax and the patella to slide back in place. If that does not work, a medical professional must manually perform an orthopedic reduction. Young athletes suffer patella dislocations more commonly than any other group, and the average age of occurrence is between 16 and 20 years of age. Sports commonly associated with this injury involve sudden twisting motions of the knee and or impact, such as soccer, gymnastics, ice hockey, and wrestling. It can also occur when a person trips over an object or slips on a slick surface, especially if that person has a predisposing factor. People often describe the pain as being inside the kneecap. The leg tends to flex even when relaxed. In some cases, the injured ligaments involved in the patellar dislocation do not allow the leg to flex at all. The telltale sign of a ruptured patella tendon is the movement of the patella further up into the quadriceps. When the rupture occurs, the patella loses support from the tibia and moves towards the hip when the quadriceps muscle contracts, which hinders the leg's ability to extend. This means that those affected cannot stand as their knee buckles and gives way when they attempt to do so. Patella tendon ruptures are common as a secondary injury after chronic inflammation such as patellar tendonitis has previously created damage and degradation of the tendon structure and strength. Signs and symptoms of patellar tendon rupture include severe pain, inability to extend the knee, and obvious deformity. Management should include splinting and extension if possible and referring to a physician. Patella tendon ruptures are rare in sports. Apophysitis are conditions that involve irritation and inflammation of the growth plates and are commonly seen in active children. The growth plates involved in these conditions are called apophysites. Apophysis are cartilaginous growth plates found throughout a child's body and serve as attachment sites for muscles and tendons. Unlike epiphysis, which are growth plates found at the ends of long bones that serve as sites for bone elongation or growth. When a young athlete participates in an activity or sport that requires repetitive use of a particular muscle group, such as the quadriceps in running or jumping, the weak link is the cartilaginous attachment site or the apophysis. This tugging on the apophysis will cause microscopic cracks in the cartilaginous growth plate, leading to inflammation and pain. Another way to understand this is to imagine a cable attached to a screw anchored in a plaster wall. If one continues to pull on the cable, it will crack the plaster at the attachment site and weaken the anchor point. This condition can occur with chronic repetitive tugging on the growth plate or with one specific event, such as a blow, fall, or sudden jump. Oshkut Slaughter's disease is a traction injury which occurs when the patella tendon pulls away from the tibial tuberosity. Sending larsen johansson disease is a traction injury which occurs when the patella ligament pulls on the inferior pole of the patella. Signs and symptoms of apophysitis injuries include pain over the affected site, inflammation, pain with active knee extension and passive flexion, Exitosis, which is a bony outgrowth or an avulsion fracture where the tendon actually pulls a chunk of bone off. Management will include price and possibly bracing to help support the patellar tendon. If an avulsion fracture has occurred, surgical intervention may be necessary. Anterior cruciate ligament injuries have two different mechanisms of injury, either contact or non-contact mechanisms. 
A non-contact ACL injury occurs as a result of a plant and a twist, such as getting a cleated foot stuck in turf or grass when changing directions. There is a valgus force on the knee, the femur internally rotates, and the tibia externally rotates. Often this injury results in an isolated ACL tear. Non-contact ACL injuries are anywhere from 6 to 10 times more common in female athletes than male athletes of the same sport. Contact ACL injuries occur as a result of a valgus force. The femur internally rotates and the tibia externally rotates or the knee hyperextends during contact. This mechanism of injury will often result in more than just the ACL being injured. Contact injuries are more common, again, in female athletes than males. The signs and symptoms of ACL injuries include diffuse pain throughout the joint. If it is an isolated ACL injury, it is possible that the patient will not report any tenderness to palpation. Rapid effusion within hours is common. Decreases in range of motion, both in flexion and extension, decreased proprioception, and a popping sensation at the time of injury is commonly reported. Patients will also complain of episodes of the knee giving out or giving way. They feel like this joint is really unstable. Management of ACL injuries should follow immediate immobilization. The patient may walk off the field, but if the ACL has been damaged, the knee is no longer stable. The more the knee moves around, the more damage could occur to the surrounding tissues in the knee. Place the patient on crutches so that they are non-weight bearing. The patient will need surgery to correct the injured ligament and restore stability to the knee. Even with surgery, approximately 80% of repaired ACL injuries will result in osteoarthritis in the knee. If not repaired, it is likely that the patient will eventually need a total knee replacement. An unhappy triad or a terrible triad is a complete or partial tear of the anterior cruciate ligament medial collateral ligament, and the medial meniscus all resulting from one single knee injury. Originally, the unhappy triad included the medial meniscus and not the lateral meniscus. However, more recent research has indicated that the classic unhappy triad is actually an unusual clinical entity among athletes with knee injuries. More recent research has indicated that lateral meniscus tears are more common than medial meniscus tears in conjunction with sprains of the ACL. An injury to the posterior cruciate ligament requires a powerful force. A common cause of injury is a bent knee hitting a dashboard in a car accident or a football player falling on a knee that is bent. Injuries to the posterior cruciate ligament are not as common as other knee ligament injuries. In fact, they are often subtle and more difficult to evaluate than other ligamentous injuries in the knee. Many times a posterior cruciate ligament injury occurs along with injuries to other structures in the knee, such as cartilage, or other ligaments and bone. Typical symptoms for a posterior cruciate ligament injury are radiating pain posteriorly, pain with swelling that occurs steadily and quickly after the injury, swelling that makes the knee stiff and may cause a limp, and difficulty walking. A popping sensation may be absent even though the tendon is ruptured. Again, the patient is going to complain that the knee feels unstable and it may give out similarly to an ACL injury. A way to evaluate for a posterior cruciate ligament sprain is by conducting the posterior sag sign. The patient is positioned supine, meaning they're laying on their back, the knee is flexed to 90 degrees, and the hip is flexed to 45 degrees. We're going to observe the level of both tibial tuberosities. We can see in the picture the tibial tuberosity on the left sags posteriorly compared to the tibial tuberosity on the right. If the sag sign is present, or it's a positive test, there is a unilateral posterior displacement of the tibia. This indicates that a PCL sprain has happened in that leg. The medial collateral ligament is the large ligament on the inside of the knee that links the femur to the tibia. Damage to a ligament is referred to as a sprain, and depending on the severity of the injury, it is classified as a first, second, or third degree as is similar to other sprains. The injury is usually caused in one of two classic ways. In collision sports such as soccer, rugby, and American football, the medial ligament can be damaged when an opponent applies a force, usually their knee, to the outside aspect of a player's leg, just above the knee. 
Alternatively, the medial ligament can be damaged if cleats get caught in the turf and the player tries to turn to the side away from the planted leg. Common signs and symptoms include medial knee pain, joint effusion, and limited range of motion. Management should include immobilization and referral. Most frequently, medial collateral ligament injuries are not surgically repaired due to poor healing rates. The main cause of lateral collateral ligament sprains is a direct force trauma on the inside of the knee. This puts a varus force pressure on the outside of the knee where the lateral collateral ligament is located and causes it to stretch or tear. It is common to have tibial external rotation at the time of injury as well, which increases the joint space. Common signs and symptoms include lateral knee pain, localized swelling if isolated, limited ranges of motion, and possible avulsion fracture of the fibular head. Management should include immobilization and referral. It is more common for a lateral collateral ligament sprain to be repaired surgically, unlike the medial collateral ligament. A meniscus tear is usually caused by twisting or turning quickly, often with the foot planted while the knee is bent. Meniscus tears can occur when you lift something heavy or you play sports. As you get older, your meniscus gets worn. This can make it tear more easily. Signs and symptoms of a meniscus tear include pain at the joint line, delayed effusion, limited range of motion, especially a loss of full extension, clicking, snapping, or locking with movement, feeling like the joint is giving out, and movie theater sign, which is knee pain after prolonged sitting. Management will include immobilization and referral. If it is a small tear, the injury may be managed by treating the symptoms of the injury. If it is a more serious tear, the injury may be managed by surgery, including suturing the damaged meniscus, or if an avascular portion is damaged, the protocol might include removal of either part or all of the damaged tissue in a procedure known as a meniscectomy. Meniscus tears are classified by their shape and location. Different types of menisci injuries include longitudinal or vertical tears, transverse or radial tears, horizontal flap tears, a bucket handle tear, oblique flap tear, and a displaced horizontal flap tear. Here are some examples of MRI pictures of the meniscus. In a normal MRI, there should be two dark triangles representing the menisci. We can see on all of these MRI pictures that they are missing either one or both of the dark triangles indicating potential damage to either one or both menisci. An osteochondral defect is any type of damage to articular cartilage and underlying subchondral bone. Usually osteochondral defects appear on the specific weight-bearing spots at the end of the femur and at the top of the tibia and in the back of the kneecap or patella. Osteochondral defects can range from a roughened cartilage that causes slight pain, small bone and cartilage fragments that hinder movement, or a complete cartilage loss that leaves your bones grinding against each other. Osteochondritis desiccans is a joint condition in which the bone underneath the cartilage of a joint dies due to lack of blood flow. This bone and cartilage can then break loose and cause pain and possibly hinder joint motion. This condition is also referred to as joint mice and may result in joint locking. Twisting forces combined with direct impact like being tackled in football commonly cause osteochondral defects. Sports that put you at risk for accidental collision and require quick changes of direction like soccer, basketball, and skiing may also put you at risk for damage to your articular cartilage. Signs and symptoms of osteochondral defects or osteochondritis desiccans include diffuse joint pain, joint effusion, and joint locking or catching. Management should focus on treating the symptoms of the patient. Surgery may be necessary if it is determined that there are small bone fragments in the joint causing locking. The picture in the center of the slide are different joint mice that have been surgically removed from different patients. They vary in size, but they look a lot like little pebbles. Patellofemoral pain syndrome is a broad term used to describe pain in the front of the knee and around the patella or around the kneecap. Problems with alignment of the kneecap and overuse from vigorous athletics and training are often significant factors. Signs and symptoms of patellofemoral stress syndrome include pain around the patella, clicking, feeling like the knee is unstable or the knee is giving out, and poor patella tracking. 
Symptoms are often relieved with conservative treatments, such as changes in activity levels or as therapeutic exercise programs are implemented. Patellofemoral stress syndrome is sometimes called runner's knee or jumper's knee because it is common in people who participate in sports, particularly females and young athletes. But patellofemoral pain syndrome can occur in non-athletes as well. The pain and stiffness it causes can make it difficult to climb stairs, kneel down, and perform other everyday activities. Many things may contribute to the development of patellofemoral pain syndrome. Patellofemoral pain syndrome could be the result of a combination of fat pad syndrome, chondromalacia patella, tendinopathy, bursitis, iliotibial band friction syndrome, and plica. Generalized pain in the front of the knee is also known as anterior knee pain, but can have many causes. One cause is impingement of the fat pad. The fat pad is a mass of fatty tissue that lies below the patella and behind the patellar tendon. Fat pad impingement can occur when the fat pad becomes swollen and inflamed due to a direct blow, hyperextension injury, or chronic irritation. As a result, the bottom tip or inferior pole of the patella can pinch the fat pad. A person who has excessive hyperextension or genu recurvatum of the knee may be more prone to this condition. Fat pad impingement can be easily confused with patella tendonitis. However, patella tendonitis tends to cause pain only at the patella tendon, especially at the inferior pole of the patella. Fat pad impingement will cause pain and swelling on either side of the patella tendon where the fatty tissue sits. The pain may be worse with jumping, prolonged standing, or any other position that causes the knees to extend. Fat pad impingement is also not associated with any clicking, locking, or joint instability. Long-term fat pad inflammation may result in scarring and calcification of the fat pad. Management of fat pad syndrome is typically priced with an emphasis on rest. Chondromalacia patella is an abnormal softening of the cartilage on the underside of the patella. Chondromalacia is a very common cause of pain in the front of the knee. Chondromalacia patella is one of the most common causes of chronic knee pain. Chondromalacia patella results from a degeneration of the cartilage due to poor alignment of the kneecap or patella as it slides over the lower end of the femur. This process is sometimes referred to as patella femoral syndrome. Patients with chondromalacia patella frequently have abnormal patellar tracking towards the lateral or outside of the femur. This slightly off-kilter pathway allows for the undersurface of the patella to grate along the femur, causing chronic inflammation and pain. Certain individuals are predisposed to develop chondromalacia patella, and they include females from the wide pelvis, knock-kneed or flat-footed runners, and those with unusually shaped patella undersurfaces. Signs and symptoms are often asymptomatic until enough of the patella has worn away. Then patients will complain of deep and diffuse pain and increased pain with knee extension and compression of the patella. Management should include a referral of the patient to receive x-rays or a surgical scope to determine the extent of injury. Patellofemoral pain syndrome can also be caused by abnormal tracking of the kneecap in the trochlear groove. In this condition, the patella is pushed out to one side of the groove when the knee is bent. This abnormality may cause increased pressure between the back of the patella and the trochlea, irritating the soft tissue. Factors that contribute to poor tracking of the kneecap include problems with alignment of the leg between the hip and the ankles. Problems in alignment may result in a kneecap that shifts too far towards the outside or lateral side of the leg or possibly the inside of the leg, although that's less common. It could also include a patella that rides too high in the trochlear groove, a condition called patella alta. Muscular imbalances or weakness, especially in the quadriceps muscle in the front of the thigh, when the knee bends and straightens, the quadriceps muscles and quadricep tendon help keep the kneecap within the trochlear groove. Weak or imbalanced quadricep muscles can cause poor tracking of the kneecap within the groove. Tendinopathy in the knee includes patellar, quadriceps, and pes answering tendinitis and tendinosis. Patellar tendinitis is also known as jumper's knee. It is most common in athletes whose sports involve frequent jumping, such as basketball and volleyball. However, even people who do not participate in jumping sports can get patellar tendinitis. Most knee tendinopathy injuries 
are a result of overuse injuries. However, they can also be from a direct compressive force. Signs and symptoms include dull, achy pain over the tendon, swelling, tendon thickening, increased pain with stretching, and active contractions of the knee. Management should include price and SEDS, and a patellar strap, also known as a chopat strap, may help the tendon and change the line of pull of the muscle. Knee bursitis is an inflammation of the bursa located near your knee joint. A bursa is a small fluid-filled pad-like sac that reduces friction and cushions pressure points between your bones and the tendons and muscles near your joint. Each of your knees has 11 bursa. While any of these bursa can become inflamed, the prepartella bursa and the pes anserine bursa are the most common to be irritated. Knee bursitis can be the result of an acute direct blow or from an overuse injury. It can also be an extremely recurrent injury, meaning it comes and goes. Knee bursitis signs and symptoms may vary, depending on which bursa is affected and what precisely is causing the inflammation. In general, the affected portion of your knee may feel warm, tender, or swollen when you put pressure on it. You may also feel pain when you move or even at rest. A sharp blow to the knee can cause symptoms to appear rapidly, but most causes of knee bursitis result from repetitive injuries, sustained in jobs that require a lot of kneeling, so symptoms usually begin gradually and may worsen over time. Iliotibial band inflammation is an overuse syndrome that occurs most often in long distance runners, bicyclists, and other athletes who repeatedly squat. The iliotibial band syndrome may be the result of a combination of issues, including poor training habits, poor flexibility of muscles, and other mechanical imbalances in the body, especially involving the low back, pelvis, hips, and knees. There can be a predisposition to develop IT band syndrome. Anatomy issues may include differences in the lengths of the legs or a leg length discrepancy, an abnormal tilt to the pelvis, or bow-leggedness, which is also referred to as genuverum. These situations can cause the iliotibial band to become excessively tight, leading to increased friction when the band crosses back and forth across the femoral condyle during activity. Other activities with increased knee flexion can cause symptoms including rowing and weightlifting, especially with excessive squatting. Common signs and symptoms of IT band friction syndrome include pain over the lateral femoral epicondyle and iliotibial band tightness. Management should include price, NSAIDs, and IT band stretching. The use of a foam roller to help stretch the tissue is very helpful. Plica syndrome, also known as synovial plica syndrome, is a condition which occurs when the plica, or an extension of the protective synovial capsule of the knee, becomes irritated, enlarged, or inflamed. This inflammation is typically caused by the plica being caught on the femur or being pinched between the femur and the patella. The most common location of plica tissue is along the medial side of the knee. The plica can tether the patella to the femur, be located between the femur and the patella, or be located along the femoral condyle. If the plica tethers the patella to the femoral condyle, the symptoms may cause it to be mistaken for chondromalacia patella. Plica are sometimes visible on MRI. The plica themselves are remnants of the fetal stage of development where the knee is divided into three compartments. The plica normally diminishes in size during the second trimester of fetal development as the three compartments develop into the synovial capsule. In adults, they normally exist as sleeves of tissue called synovial folds. The plica are usually harmless and unobtrusive. Plica syndrome only occurs when the synovial capsule becomes irritated, which thickens the plica themselves, making them more prone to irritation and inflammation or being caught on the femur. Signs and symptoms of plica are pain with prolonged sitting, then sharp pain felt 8 to 10 steps when standing and beginning to walk, popping and clicking, a palpable ridge or bump over the medial aspect of the knee, and pseudo-locking, which means that the joint kind of gets stuck, but you can still move through a full range of motion. Management includes price, NSAIDs, stretching, and possibly surgery to remove the plica. The perineal nerve is found on the outside part of the lower knee. This nerve is responsible for transmitting impulses to and from the leg, foot, and toes. When damaged, the muscles innervated by this nerve may become weak and sensation may be lost. A condition called foot drop can occur. Foot drop is the inability to raise the foot upwards. A perineal nerve injury is commonly caused by an injury to the leg. 
Trauma to the nerve can occur with a kick, blow, or increased pressure to the area, a broken leg bone, knee injury, surgery to the leg or knee, and ankle injuries. We have even seen cases of peroneal nerve irritation in the athletic training facility when we place ice on an athlete's knee. Because the nerve is so superficial, it can easily be irritated. Symptoms of a peroneal nerve injury may cause numbness or tingling in the lower leg, pain in the foot or shin, foot weakness, a prickling sensation, or a pins and needles sensation. Management should include price, NSAIDs, and monitoring the athlete for changes. If the symptoms do not improve or remain severe, you should refer the athlete.